The descriptions of some of Ontario's long-term care homes detailed in the Canadian military's report this week were horrifying. Residents left to stew in their own feces, insect infestations, fear among staff, contagion going unchecked. It's harrowing stuff and has led to the provincial government taking over a number of homes. With us now to assess the prospects for change going forward, we welcome in Whistler, British Columbia, Laura Tamblin Watts, lawyer and CEO of the Canadian Seniors Advocacy Organization, Can Age, and an adjunct professor of law and aging at the University of Toronto. In Innisfil, Ontario, Charlene Stewart, president of SEIU Healthcare. That's the Service Employees International Union, which represents thousands of frontline workers in long-term care. And in the downtown of the provincial capital, there's Donna Duncan. She's the CEO of the Ontario Long-Term Care Association. Glad to have you three aboard for uh, obviously a very timely and important discussion uh, in light of the Canadian military's report that just came out earlier this week. I'd like to just start with everybody's reaction to the report. Laura, will you weigh in first on that? Well, I was horrified, but in some ways I wasn't surprised. And maybe that's the worst indictment of all, because we know that the issues have been endemic. And we know that the challenges have been real. To hear the report, however, so starkly said by the military really gives you pause. Because if they are shocked and horrified and they're used to going into war zones, you know, how is it for everybody else? Charlene, how about you? Uh, well, I wasn't surprised. And, you know, I do want to start off by thanking the armed forces for serving side by side for our frontline with our frontline workers. And I mean, what we witnessed in that report is what our members and the frontline staff, uh, they see in real time. So the report, you know, was over a couple of weeks, but our members have been, and families, quite honestly, have been reporting this in real time. So it wasn't a surprise. And I'm just hopeful that maybe it coming from the armed forces will be uh, the organization that triggers action once and for all. And Donna? Uh you know, I, I have to say it was horrifying. Uh, when this started, we said that we were facing a perfect storm. Uh, we knew that homes were in dire, dire straits uh, during this pandemic and as it unfolded and, and we saw the hardest homes being hit and the military went into the hardest homes. Uh, so what we have is a record of what dire looked like on May 15th and uh, we have to fix this, absolutely, it's horrific. Charlene, your people, your employees, the unionized employees you represent are in many of the homes. And I'd be curious as to which detail in the report as you read it uh, really hit home with you the most. Um, I think the fact that management uh, was absent in a lot of that report, uh, that was obviously reported to us. Uh, the frontline workers were, were raising the alarm bells over that. But to have it confirmed, it was like, oh my goodness. And again, uh, some of that stuff definitely defends the need for an inquiry to find out, is that true? How long has it happened? So that to me was uh, really gasping information that there was a lack of management in there. The whole thing was disturbing, but that was like, okay, this is real. I've heard it, but it's real. Yeah. Donna, I should give you a chance to respond to that notion that management was AWOL. You know, I think we're going to have a have a review and we'll be able to look in and dig into the details. I, I think that the thing that really struck me was the staffing shortages. The fact that in in these homes, they had lost up to 80 percent of their staff who, who, who weren't there. And if we don't have PPE and we don't have a personal protective equipment and the testing and if we don't have staff and we need those to have employees uh, and have staff come back to work. To me, that's that was what was so critical and, and reading through those uh, to, to think about what it was like for the frontline staff and is like without having any kind of support around them. Uh, to me, that that's that's stark. That's very stark. Now, Charlene, does that count as mitigating circumstances for you? No, uh, because again, uh, when people say that they weren't aware of this crisis and just days before that I had spoken to those companies who run all of those homes. And if you recall, those were the top five that we had asked government to manage weeks ago. And you know, I even looked back at our last interview and we have been identifying staffing levels being a crisis for decades. And yeah, the infection control or the infections that were listed 
the amount of uh, workers that were infected, uh, yeah, it's been reported for some time that over 50% of those frontline staff were absent. Even in the pressers report or the premier's pressers every day, they identify that we have staff shortages, they were deploying, uh, that's one of the reasons why the armed forces was brought in because it was critical and I think that's absolutely why you're seeing that information in those uh, reports because of the uh, now horrific uh, staff shortages that caused some of the consequences in that report. Well, Charlene, since you mentioned the Premier's daily briefings, uh, I, I wonder if this is a good opportunity uh, to play a clip uh, of the Premier at his daily briefings because, uh, well, we've all known him for a long time and I'm not sure I've ever seen him more um, grim or agonized over an issue uh, than he has been over long-term care. We'll discuss in a second whether or not you think his response has been appropriate to the challenge. But here's some of what Premier Ford has had to say over the last few days on this issue. Tony, roll it if you would. It's so disturbing when I, when I read this. It was hard to get through. It was the worst report, most heart-wrenching report I have ever read in my entire life. And let me be clear, we're looking at all options. We're fully prepared to take over more homes if necessary. We are fully prepared to pull licenses, to shut down facilities if it is necessary. We will do whatever it takes for as long as it takes. Laura, how would you characterize the Premier's response to this crisis so far? Well, it's been emotional. And I mean, he has himself a family member in long-term care. We appreciate the heartfelt nature of his personal response. But it is, however, part of the downflow effect of what this government has been doing, the choices that they've been making. And so when it comes down to saying that he's you know, shocked or surprised, it's hard to imagine how that's the case. Because as my colleagues have said, the reports have been clear. You know, CanAge has been joining with other advocates saying that you know, it's not just staff shortages, it's infrastructure investment. It's making sure that the training is there and making sure that we're thinking about our aging population. And by contrast, what we've seen is inspections going backwards, investment going backwards, and public health going backwards. So in a sense, it's the perfect storm which has been set up by this government's choices. Well, Charlene, let me play devil's advocate for the heck of it here. He's been in provincial politics for two and a half years. He's been premier for two years. He certainly didn't get elected on a platform of fixing long-term care. That was well down his list of priorities. Uh, can, can he reasonably make the argument that he really didn't know how bad all this was, and he's learning it in real time now with many of the rest of us? Not when it comes to my engagement with his government. Uh, I've been meeting with the Minister of Health and the Minister of Long-Term Care uh, for months now, long before the pandemic hit, and said, we have a crisis in senior care. It's not just in long-term care, but also in home care. Uh, you know, we, we could see this coming, the silver tsunami. I've been advocating and lobbying for uh, uh, addressing this uh, foreseeable crisis and you know, even in a year ago, uh, when he uh, reduced the inspections, uh, we said that is not a good thing. When he uh, put wage caps on top of these workers, we said this is going to only escalate a retention and recruitment problem. Uh, again, not having full-time work, these people uh, work in congregate settings. You know, this is a pandemic, but also flu season. Every single year, they don't have the proper PPE. We have the uh, spread of the uh, virus of the flu because of the fact that these workers work in multiple homes. All of this, I had conversations with uh, ministers about. If those ministers weren't relaying that to the premier, well, I guess he's got a problem he has to fix. Now, Donna, you and Charlene were actually on this program, uh, I think it was last uh, April 12th, uh, discussing many of these issues as well. And even though you may be on the opposite sides of the labor management issue, uh, you're probably on the same side as it relates to provincial funding for long-term care homes. You both think it's completely inadequate. My question for you, though, is for some reason, the military went into Quebec and got help in 25 homes, and Ontario got help in five. Do you have any idea why it was determined that only five homes in Ontario needed help from the Canadian military? Uh, so, Steve, my understanding is... Uh those were the resources that were available through the military. So they had enough staff 
uh, or troops who, who could only go into five homes. Uh, and these were the five most dire homes, the, those in the, in the worst situation. Do you wish there were more? You know, we did we do we wish there were more? Uh, we, you know, what I would say is um, when we were last on and, and talking to you, that was the week that the government launched an action plan. And they, and in that action plan, they stabilized, uh, prioritized long term care for PPE, for universal testing, for hospital support. Uh, and then uh, following that, they, they announced that the military would be, be coming in because, quite honestly, as, as Charlene's noted, we, we massive staff shortages. Uh, fortunately, what we're seeing, though, is, is that the efforts of, of that action plan are actually helping to stabilize homes. So 80% of the homes in long-term care in the province have been outbreak free. So we need to keep them that way. And, and we need to really focus on getting these homes, these five that are in such dire situations back on track. So uh, Hopefully we don't need more military. Uh, our, our sense is things are stabilizing. Uh, what we need to do is uh, work together with Charlene and our other partners in the healthcare system to, br to bring people back to work, to make sure that it's safe uh, and, uh, and not take our foot off the gas. This is the beginning of the pandemic, not the end. Uh, we've got about another 18 to 24 months of this. Well, and let's put all this into perspective and I don't know how helpful this is, but I'll throw it out anyway, uh, an outbreak so defined is is one case of COVID-19 per home. There are 24% of the homes in which there have therefore been outbreaks. And in apparently 48 of the 626 homes, 48, there's been one case. So um, Laura, I, I guess we want to be careful. We don't want to give the impression that COVID-19 has overrun every single home in the long-term care sector. It's certainly not the case. Um, but what do what value do you think the military has brought to the five homes in which they have been assigned? And we at CanAge would also like to thank the military for coming in. But the idea, even that, that we would need to call in the military to support essentially basic functions and fundamental rights of seniors is really stark. You know, we would like to see all hands on deck. So if there's more help that can be had, and if we can have more expanded help from the military, I know that there are more than five homes that could really benefit from it. Because of the high, high infection rate, you know, it is important that we do keep it as contained as possible. But we are, just as Donna said, we're at the beginning of this pandemic, nowhere near the end of it. And so when we have our eyes on that 24%, we are really worried about what's going to happen in the future. We can't keep this sustained level without a really robust, promising set of approaches. And we're just building those now. Charlene, do you have uh, any reason to believe that this is not contained in those 24% generally and in those five awful homes in particular? Are your, how deep are your concerns for the 75% who haven't been hit yet at all? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, we would be extremely naive to think that this problem is only in those five homes. Uh, again, you recall back and, you know, I'm, I'm just so frustrated over where we are today because Somebody asked me, do you feel uh, vindicated over this report? And absolutely not. I feel very sad and disappointed that we didn't deal with this months ago, hundreds and hundreds of deaths ago. So these are five that have been highlighted over the last couple of days, but I can name you 15 and at, at the very least that there still remains huge problems in. And was it last week? I've lost track of time, but Minister uh, Fullerton uh, put in an emergency order where they gave themselves the authority to manage homes yet only a few months ago they said they had no authority to do that so where did this miraculously come up this newfound authority and the fact that uh you know staffing levels is one thing but again we continue to ask inspections we had to get orders we had to go to the labor board to get orders to have on-site inspections so even the management that's been um announced yesterday i mean again the government, Mr. Ford, has said a lot, but acted on very little, to be honest with you. And I am feeling, you know, frustrated today and, you know, a little bit of hopelessness because I have not seen anything happen in a timely manner. So many deaths, three of our members have died with families. I mean, we owe it to those grieving people to deal with this now. So 
you know, uh, there's still lots of problems out there, and I don't want to forget that. By uh, but an inquiry also would point out who did do things right and how did they do it. And those homes that weren't infected, let's celebrate that and learn from that. So that's what we need to look forward to too. Well, since you mentioned workers and shifts there, I want to put that to Donna because the military report did indicate that uh, in these five homes, some workers' hours and shifts were reduced when the military arrived. And I wonder if you could shed some light on why that would have been the case. Yeah, you know, Steve, I, so I haven't been in the homes and it's, it's not clear to me what, what underlies that. Uh, I do know that in, in many cases, these, these homes were working at 20% of their staff. Uh, and I understand that uh, those staff were, were, were exhausted and, and quite honestly traumatized. So needing to take time off to catch their breath uh, certainly was, was, as I understand it, core to, to having them being able to have the military come in, take some relief, uh, and, uh, and then come back to work. Marilee Fullerton is, of course, the Minister for Long-Term Care. She is a medical doctor. Uh, she indicated that she spent her early years in medical practice working in long-term care and taking care of uh, senior citizens. Uh, she's been prominent at the Premier's Daily Briefings. Let's hear a little clip from her, and then we'll come back and chat. Tony, if you would. This is something that everyone has known about. For years, our population is aging. Long-term care was ignored. Long-term care was neglected. I came here and had the privilege of becoming Ontario's Minister of Long-Term Care, the only Minister of Long-Term Care in all of Canada, thanks to Premier Ford. We were shining the light on this. We were looking at fixing a system that had been neglected and ignored for decades. And then COVID. And COVID tipped the homes that were having difficulties with staffing already right over the edge. I want to have a bit of a discussion here about, um, well, look, it, it is not unknown for the opposition to call for a ministerial resignation when you know what hits the fan. Uh, it's also the case that she may well be, as Premier Ford said yesterday, the best qualified person, given her background, to sort all this out. So I wonder if I could get the three of you to weigh in on whether or not you think this minister should resign. Laura, you first. I think that we need more hands on deck, not changes at this point. It's clear that Minister Fullerton is trying. It's a very challenging circumstance. And at CanAge, we sympathize with the many challenges that she's facing. But you know, to do a shift in leadership right now, I think would be precipitous. She does probably need help and support, and she does need more input from organizations and seniors and advocates. There's been a, a real shortage of being able to work together with this government. So I think a more open arms approach would be more helpful than a change in regime. Donna, do we need a new Minister of Long-Term Care right now? Well, you're, you're going to see me uh, agreeing with Laura. This is not the time to change. This is the time for stabilization. Uh, we need to come together. Uh, but, but it can't just be about Minister Fullerton and, and at the Ministry of Long-Term Care. Where's the Ministry of Health? Where's Treasury Board? Where's infrastructure? Where's municipal affairs? Uh, where are, you know, we need to work together across, across the government, across municipalities, with the federal government, uh, and also with our, our healthcare partners and our labor partners. Uh, this is a time where we all have to put aside our differences, uh, stop being polarizing, uh, focus on what has to be fixed today. And as, as Laura and Charlene has said, we, we know what needs to be done today. So let's let's get together um, and, and align. And because it, together we can get it done. But if we fight and, and point fingers and try to destabilize and bring politics into this, um, I, I think it's going to end badly. Uh, you know, Charlene, Donna makes a good point in as much as it's not Marilee Fullerton who makes up the long-term care ministry budget. Uh, it is the Minister of Finance. It is the Minister responsible, the President responsible for Treasury Board. Uh, so uh, in your view, is it fair to sort of have her carry the whole can for this thing? Uh, no, absolutely not. It isn't. And again, that is why I am so insistent on having a public inquiry. Do I think that resignations should be called upon? I do think that that may be the outcome of an inquiry. And again, I started by saying the biggest surprise in that report is that management was missing. You know, there wasn't registered staff on, on site. So I think that is something that an inquiry would come out. Uh, and if that's a recommendation, then so be it. And people will handle it there. But I think that inquiry has to answer a lot before we start making those kinds of decisions. Hmm. 
Laura, in your view, how much of a role did this government's changes to the inspections regimen, how much of a role did that contribute to the current state of affairs? Well, because that's actually only just been a short term, and we think about this thing as having decades in the making, uh, you know, pulling back from inspections is bad, but it's certainly not the only thing that we know has contributed. We do need more robust inspections. We need inspections that are surprise inspections and comprehensive inspections. But there's a bigger piece of this too. What are they expecting and what are we regulating? Are we regulating a lot of tick boxes or are we fundamentally looking at quality of care? So, you know, Ontario has an enormously regulated long-term care system. This is, you know, in many cases, good law, bad practice. But I think we also just need to be able to understand, you know, are we looking at the right quality indicators? And I have to say, I don't think that it is. We wouldn't be in the circumstance if we were. Donna, I have to put this to you. I was on the phone yesterday for, I guess, for about an hour with a former inspector in this province who basically, and I, I wrote it up in a column. It's on our website, tvo.org. Anybody can read it right now. But essentially, uh, this former inspector laid out a situation uh, that, um, well, in, you know, she, it, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. She saw tremendous, amazing people she described as angels taking care of residents in long-term care homes. She also saw uh, senior officials in the Ministry of Health uh, getting together in the parking lot ahead of time and saying to inspectors, uh, you know, I, I know who the person is who runs this home. We're going to give this person a clean bill of health uh, before we even walk into this place. Uh, I mean, that, that sort of borders on, on corrupt practices. Uh, how, what, what role has inspections, good and bad, played in the mess that we're in today? Well, you know, Steve, I, you know, I think inspections play an important role. Uh, certainly, Justice Scalise spoke about inspections in, in her inquiry report. And let's not forget, we've just been through an inquiry. And, and her, her advice and her guidance was that we needed to move to a just culture. We needed to change the tone and approach. Uh, and to Laura's point, point we, need, we need to look at quality indicators. You know, when, you know, how do we have a staffing problem? Well, we have a staffing problem when the inspection regime is all about failures. Imagine mm -hmm. being an employee when you know the inspectors are arriving and all you can do is fail. So if you had to trade out a, a, a food item on the menu, you failed to meet the dietary needs of, of your resident. How do we make it focused on quality improvement, uh, a much more um, uh, compliance orientation and quality improvement process as opposed to uh, looking for things to, to tick box to, to get you. Uh, I think that you know the the tone and approach uh, that the ministry is now taking is is an improvement but we have work to do together uh, to improve what what the inspection regime looks like but we also have to recognize that inspections are, are well important. Uh, they aren't about uh, replacing the capital infrastructure or making the, the upgrades right now that we need no need to happen over the summertime from an infection prevention and control uh, and, and you know continuing with testing continuing with, with prioritization of PPE. Uh, how do we get staff? How do we train staff and support them? How do we start better integrating long-term care into those other parts of the healthcare system uh, together with hospitals and public health and emergency services in a way where we now have a collective responsibility to work together to lift up the system and lift up employees in a very productive uh, and structured way as opposed to looking at inspections in isolation. Charlene, the minister said yesterday at her press briefing, inspections are not the reason why we're facing this crisis right now. She puts it really on the uh, on the head of COVID-19. What's your view? Oh, no, inspections have been a problem. And in the report, I mean, even the cockroaches that are identified in there, uh, we reported that uh, last year in some of our uh, lobbying, advertising and uh, letters to the government. Uh, those issues have been identified by the workers. I'm not so sure the inspectors have been listing those in their reports. Uh, you know, the um, access to uh, equipment being locked up, including briefs, that's been an issue for, you know, a decade that we've been complaining about that. Uh, but the, um, the example that you gave is, you know, alarming, but that is what we're seeing. I mean, they're given heads up of when the inspections are happening. So they call staff in, pay them over time to get things cleaned up for the inspection. And then even, we, I've seen examples where there have been orders of violations uh, issued 
and you know they come back to inspect the same uh, violations have reoccurred uh, that's why when the premier said yesterday that if this continues he will remove licenses um, again a lot of talk and i guess we'll have to see if that becomes action because these violations and uh, bad inspection reports have been going on for uh, years it's the action that we're all calling on now let's get into some discussion here about um the best format going forward. You know that both the Toronto Star and the opposition leader, Andrea Horvath, have essentially said there's no place for private operators in the long-term care sector. Uh, let's discuss that. Donna, what's your view on that? So what is the problem we're solving for is the question I would ask, Steve. And, uh, you know, we, our association, we represent homes that are nonprofit, char small charitable, as well as small independent uh, private homes as well, and, and the large uh, publicly traded homes. Uh, as we look at what the challenges are that have uh, certainly been uncovered by COVID-19 uh, and look at the root causes, the root causes are, are not ownership. The root causes are the age of the home, uh, four bed uh, rooms, uh, shared washrooms, the state of the infrastructure, uh, the state of uh, their human resources, uh, the homes that we're seeing that are in the worst shape uh, have the most critical staffing shortages. We, we have to look at the, the spread of COVID-19. So the hotspots, the homes that have been most mostly impacted are in, in what they call the hotspots uh, for, for that social spread uh, and also very dense, dense communities as well. Uh, we're looking at as well the fact that the, out, the great, greatest outbreaks and the worst outbreaks um, were uh, before the action uh, plan actually came into effect. And so we're, we're certainly seeing stabilization once we got prioritized. You know, you know, as we look uh, around the world and, and certainly see the impact that COVID-19 had on long-term care homes around the world globally, um, you know, where and I when I talk to my 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 colleagues in the UK or, or Switzerland and Spain, they're telling me the problem with this is the prioritization of hospitals at the beginning. Uh, we're just really lucky in Ontario and Canada that we didn't have that hospital surge. So how do we stabilize the homes now? Focus on the, the root causes of the problems uh, and 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 act. Right now is not the time to destabilize the sector. And I think while people want to talk about uh, ownership and for profit or non profit. Uh, I think we need to be talking about what are the measures we need to put in place to have a very stable, um, ec uh, economically viable system as well uh, that is built around the needs of the residents, uh, that, is, uh, that supports our staff and make sure that our human resources are there and that they feel safe and, and that these are places that uh, loved ones uh, want to have their family members in uh, and, that, uh, and that they're part of an integrated healthcare system. Uh, as we look at uh, other parts of the system where there are other private elements like home care and uh, uh, other uh, services, um, you know, I think the, the integration of, of, of long-term care is the thing we should be focusing on, not uh, dividing and conquering based on ownership right now. Well, Charlene, I've been told there are poorly run not-for-profit homes and well-run for-profit homes and vice versa as well. Uh, I've been told that, and in fact, the uh, senior, ministry, uh, senior ministry of health officials the other day had a briefing in which they said ownership status is really not an indication of how well or poorly a home operates. What's your view on this? Well, I will never agree that uh, corporations who make profits off of services to human beings is something that I would um, accept. So uh, the data right now, and you know, that's what I rely on a lot is data, and you just did cite some. But in this pandemic issue, I mean, the data is there. The for-profit homes uh, had the worst outcomes, and I do agree with Donna, like uh, the structure of the buildings is an issue. But again, um, when you've got uh, corporations who are clearly accountable to shareholders and this uh, long-term care, the nursing home sector is publicly funded uh, and privately managed by not-for-profit and for-profit, the for-profits have to come out of somewhere. And uh, thankfully people do not pay to be in a nursing home, they do to be in retirement homes. But when for-profits and not-for-profits get exactly the same funding to run their business, and the for-profits are held accountable to shareholders and high CEO salaries, the money has got to come out of the public purse. And there's uh, two envelopes that uh, the public or the funding comes from. 
Obviously, nursing is one that has the nursing care, but there's also the other envelope that is responsible for hiring staff like cooks and housekeepers. That's where in that report, when you saw some of the, you know, the cleanliness and the cockroaches, uh, you know, that is where that, that, uh, those problems arise uh, from. And when you're cutting from one of those envelopes, it, that's the envelope that they cut from. And how can anybody argue that that's gonna have a, a result in the care and the conditions of those homes as well? Charlene, I got to ask this follow up and I'm not ascribing any motive here, I, I, I promise you, but, uh, but I've got to ask the follow up. Uh, most for profit homes don't have unionized staff. I think most, if not all, not for profit homes uh, or municipally run homes do have unionized staff. Um, you know, let's put two and two together. Is that one of the reasons why you'd like to see more homes in the non profit sector as opposed to the for profit sector? Um, well, that's interesting statistics because in long-term care, I think a good portion of it is is unionized. So, um, but no, that's that's not it. It's truly the outcomes that I'm looking at, and I can only speak for myself. Um, you know, the uh, it's the evidence is there that the for profits have got there's the good ones, but the majority have got severe problems in it. Okay, I had to ask, Laura, what's your view on this public versus private? You know, it, we're a pan-Canadian organization, so we look to see what's happening in other parts of the country as well. And, you know, I, I worry about just vilifying for profits. I think there's some fundamental problems that Charlene is talking about that I absolutely agree with. You know, what's the dividend that we're trying to get? Is it a financial dividend paid to shareholders or is it a care dividend which goes back into the system? But there's some other pieces to it as well. I mean, right now in Ontario, about 60% of all long-term care is private. Um, and so it won't be so easy as to flip a switch and to say, we're just gonna change it, we're gonna nationalize it, we're gonna do that. It, this is not gonna be an easy thing to do. But when it, essentially what we have to look at is like, what is the kind of care that we're trying to get? So we are looking very closely at the Australian model, which is set up like Canada in the sense of a federated system. They have states and we have provinces and they have an organizing body that establishes care standards that make sure that they have robust tools to ensure enforcement, to make sure that they can engage in fines and so on. And so as we're thinking about this issue and wrestling, I think as a province and a country about should there be or shouldn't there be uh, not for profit or for profit or what the mix is, you know, in the immediate measure, let's take standards based approach and actually get the systems up to the place where it's stabilized enough to have that deeper conversation. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight. I suspect uh, this will not be the last word on this subject as this story continues to uh, garner headlines. And it's really good of the three of you to make some time in your schedule to help our viewers understand this subject so much better. Uh, Laura Tamblin Watts out on the West Coast, uh, Donna Duncan from the Long-Term Care Association here in the provincial capital, Charlene Stewart in Innisfil. Uh, she's the president of SEIU Healthcare. Thanks, you three, and be well. Thank you. You too. Be Thank well. You. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.